Στις αρχές του 1900 ο Γάλλος κινηματογραφιστής Ζορζ Μελιέ γοήτευε τους θεατές του παρουσιάζοντας ανθρώπους να εξαφανίζονται μέσα σε ένα σύννεφο καπνού και να μεταμορφώνονται σε αντικείμενα ή στέλνοντας μια διαστημική κάψουλα να προσγειωθεί στο μάτι ενός φεγγαριού που μιλούσε. Όλα αυτά ο Μελιέ, ο οποίος πριν ασχοληθεί με το σινεμά ήταν ταχυδακτηλουργός και θαυματοποιός, τα κατάφερνε χρησιμοποιώντας μια μαγική τεχνική που λέγεται stop καρέ. Σήμερα ξέρουμε πως πίσω από τις υπέροχες ψευδεστήσεις του σινεμά, τα αυτοκίνητα που ανατινάζονται, τα κτίρια που αρπάζουν φωτιά, τους υπερήρωες που πετάνε, δεν υπάρχει καμία μαγεία. Υπάρχει επιστήμη, τεχνολογία, μηχανική, μαθηματικά. Με μία λέξη STEM. Τα ειδικά εφέ του Hollywood μπορούν να μας διδάξουν πολλά για όλα αυτά. Ο Στίβ Γουλφ, επιστήμονας, τηλεοπτικός παραγωγός και παρουσιαστής, είναι πρόεδρος της εταιρείας παραγωγής Wolf Standworks και ιδρυτής του Science in the Movies, μιας πρωτοβουλίας που σκοπό έχει να βοηθήσει πολλά παιδιά να αποκτήσουν δεξιότητες STEM μέσω της μελέτης των ειδικών εφέ που χρησιμοποιούνται στις ταινίες. Το μεγαλύτερο πράγμα που μπορείς να κάνεις για έναν μαθητή είναι να ενισχύσεις την αίσθηση της περίεργειάς του, λέει ο Στίβ Βούλφ, ο οποίος έχει εργαστεί σε πολλές ταινίες του Hollywood αλλά και σε πολύ γνωστές τηλεοπτικές παραγωγές. Με περισσότερα από 28 χρόνια διδασκαλία STEM στο βιογραφικό του, ο Στίβ Βούλφ βρίσκεται σήμερα εδώ στο Athens Science Festival 2021. Στην ομιλία του με τίτλο η επιστήμη των ειδικών εφέ και, τα, και τον κασκαντέρ θα μας αποκαλύψει τους τρόπους με τους οποίους χρησιμοποιείται η επιστήμη για όλα τα special effects που θαυμάζουμε στη μεγάλη οθόνη, έτσι ώστε οι ταινίες να γίνονται ακόμα πιο συναρπαστικές και η ζωή λίγο ακόμα πιο μαγική. Τη συζήτηση θα συντονίσει ο Θοδωρής Αναγνωστόπουλος, science engager, κοινωνικός επιχειρηματίας, public speaker και συνειδητής του Athens Science Festival. Ο λόγος σε εσάς. I would like to add that um, we don't get a, um, a, sp a speaker uh, with such a unique background and such a disruptive work uh, very frequently, such as the work that Steve Wolf does. Um, I will use one of his quotes that uh, when he was asked while burning a car, um, what he was doing, he said, I'm just doing, doing STEM, STEM education. Um, this is probably one of the most disruptive media that one can use um, movies, basically, and special effects in order to teach science. I would say that this is the most um, engaging medium that one can use. Um, I will pass on to Steve because I don't think that anybody can wait. So, uh, Steve, uh, welcome. Welcome to the Athens Science Festival. We're really looking forward to you. Thank you. I'm going to open up with a video. Okay. Here we go. For 30 years, Steve Wolf has thrilled audiences with stunts and special effects for movies and TV shows. Blowing things up. While working with stars, including Tom Cruise, Samuel Jackson, Robert De Niro, Brad Pitt, Tom Hanks, Howard, Mary Louise Parker, Paul Pacino, David Duchovny, Bruce Willis, Whitney Houston, Barkhead Abney, Dude Perfect, Mike Rock, Larry the Cable Guy, and David Letterman. He engages audiences with science-intensive shows, such as Discovery's Presidential Beast, Expedition Bismarck, and an ambitious Hindenburg special to solve the mystery of the greatest air disaster. The Science Channel's exploration of Houdini's escapes and the History Channel's mission to test the science of ancient inventions. 
but his real passion has always been getting kids excited about science. My name is Steve Wolf. I'm a stunt and special effects coordinator for movies and television shows. So I take the basic science education that I had and I use that to make a living that's pretty exciting in the movie business. Hi, my name is Steve Wolf. Hi, Dr. Wolf. And our family has been doing stunts and special effects for about 27 years. My dad has thrown people off roofs, crashed cars, lit people on fire, and blown up buildings. So, uh, we have an opportunity to get hurt. We work with a lot of science, though. And safety. And safety, too. Thanks. I always forget that. Uh, so, you guys like fire? Good. If I make it out of fuel, okay, which is anything that burns, and then I need oxygen, which I borrow from this room, I won't take too much of it, and then I need to have heat, and I have to have a, a chemical reaction. All right, now before I expose you guys to these chemicals, uh, of course, we always want to follow chemical safety, right? So we're going to release this stuff in the air. We want to know if it's safe for us. I developed this rule for chemical safety called the five-in rule. The five-in rule says if you're going to be in contact with something, touching it, right? If you're going to be inhaling something, ingesting something, or injecting something, then you have to read the in instructions, all right? That's the only way to know. It says right here, the contents of this vessel or wouldn't it, uh, are safe for human inhalation. What does that mean? Safe to breathe, right? Long-term exposure may cause hair loss. I don't believe that. Come on. No. All right, so I'm going to get a little bit of fuel. This is a fuel called propane, by the way. It's a hydrocarbon fuel. It's made out of which two elements? But it's hydrogen and carbon. So we bring our fire into here, and now we've got our house on fire. Because when we're making a house on fire in the movies, we don't use real houses, because real houses will burn down in about 20 minutes. We have to have a house that can stay on fire for as long as we need it to. If we're not filming over here, we don't need fire there. Right? If this is like the twins jump out of the window over here, so we can just tell this fire, to, you can go over here too. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Thank you. I need you over here. Good. Thank you. Excellent. All right. All right, good. This is what we want you to do, but this is just rehearsal. I need you to just wait. I need, I need you to wait back in the bottle now. Yeah, you'll get to come out again in a minute. Thanks. Good. All right. You guys know I'm just messing around, right? You can't tell fire where to go. Really, what, what we're doing here is we were just playing around with these valves back here. So by opening and closing valves, we can control where the fire goes on a movie set. You guys know what a valve is, right? It's a simple mechanical device that controls the flow of a fluid. You know what fluids are? Yeah, okay, I'll give you a hint. Uh, two out of the three states of matter are fluids, and solids are not one of them. Uh, liquids and gas, right? Anything that takes the shape of the container you put it in is a Oh, excuse me a second. Hang on. Didn't realize I had my house so dirty here. Just clean that up for you. All right, there we go. Ugh. Look at that. It looks like my kid's room after a play date, huh? You know what this is? So this is actually evidence that we had a chemical reaction here. This stuff is something we just made today. It wasn't there before because the crew did a great job cleaning this thing up to make sure it looked nice for you. This stuff called carbon, you know what this can do to you? Who says kill you? Absolutely right. 10,000 pounds of carbon falls on your head, boom, you're dead, just like that. Other than that, this stuff won't hurt you at all, maybe just get you a little bit of dirty. And there is a, actually a dirty little secret about carbon, and that's that uh, you're made out of it. It's not just you, okay? It's your, you know, your parents and teachers and everything that you eat. Every living thing on this planet made out of carbon. Now, why do we set houses on fire in movies? Looks cool, right? But the thing is, you couldn't have a whole movie just about a house on fire. You know, you have to have somebody stuck in the house. Maybe they're hiding up on the roof, you know, and they're trying to get away from the fire, and they're trying to figure, you know, how they're going to not get eaten up as the fire burns through the roof. What are they going to do? Uh, I'm going to have to jump off the roof. Now, there, there's a secret to jumping off roofs, okay? The secret is it doesn't matter if the roof is one foot high, the roof is 500 feet high. All that the stunt person has to do, I'm going to show you, all that they have to do is take one step. And what does the work of getting them to the ground? That's my secret. I go to work, I take one step, gravity does all the work, but I get to keep all the money. It's a pretty good deal, right? Is there anyone who want, wouldn't want a job like that? Go to work, take one step, your job's done. Get your money, go home. No? Why not? Think that's dangerous? Okay. Some people think it's dangerous. Uh, uh, 27 years of stunt work. I really can't remember one time I ever saw anyone get hurt falling. I've seen some people get killed landing. That's a completely different part of the stunt, though, right? So, so when we land, we make sure we have something nice and soft underneath us. We use air because air is a gas, and gases are compressible. You can squeeze them, and they give you a nice, soft, safe landing. Then we just have to figure out how to get back up again so we can jump again. Because, you know, it's not daredevil work, it's, it's science. 
I'm an engineer and we have to figure out how these things get done safely. So when we want to get back to the top of a tall building, we use this technology called an elevator. But if we're filming in the jungle, we have to get up on top of a cliff or pull someone up from a deep crevice in the ground, then we have to have some simple machines that we could bring with us and set up anywhere. So there's six different types of simple machines. What are they? We have wheels and axles, levers, wedges, screws, inclined planes, and pulleys. And pulleys have always been my favorite. I'm going to show you why. I've got a, a bunch of pulleys here. And uh, when I was in fourth grade, my teacher said that using pulleys, you could lift things that are heavier than you are. When I went in my house to see if my teacher was right, uh, when she said I could lift things that are heavier than I was if I had pulleys. But I, I hooked up some pulleys in my backyard and I ran in my house looking for something heavy to lift. And the first thing I found was my mom. And she was a great sport. She let me actually hook her up to this thing and lift her up. Thank you, Mom. Appreciate Wait, it. How high up are we? my mom right here, by the way. Um, now, let me explain how this thing works. One pulley just changes the direction of the force of a rope, all right? But if you use more than one pulley, it divides the load. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. Load is a physics term for something that's being lifted. So it divides the load by the number of ropes that are holding it up. Okay. okay. So if you want to know, do the math, you know, just think that pulley stings, stands for pieces of line. How many pieces of line are there that are holding you up? Uh, it's a, it's taking some liberties on spelling, but in English you can do that. All right. So we're going to start to pull down on that rope. Go ahead. Pull fast. Pull, pull, pull. We're going to see what happens. Oh, if we can lift. We want to make sure this stuff is strong, right? Not, not strong like if you sit on it, you know, it crushes. That's compressive strength. We're looking here at for tensile strength, which is you, you pull on something and it doesn't break. And he seems to so far be going up. Life was in the hands of middle schoolers. Oh, my, you are in trouble. Whoa, is everything good with that? What do you think, CJ? Yeah, that's good. Whoa, whoa. Oh, I, I, I did forget something. Darn right. Always forget something. I, I said whenever we have a stunt person in the air, we have to have something nice and soft underneath. There we go. Ooh, what's your name? Marion, how are you? So, Marion, I'm going to be honest with you. You actually have all the danger right now. You know what this tells me, though? This tells me that you're very brave. You're willing to take some risks. And in the science community, that's going to be a good thing for you. In fact, you'll be rewarded with responsibility. You know what responsibility is? Yeah, it means if you're in charge of something, no matter what happens, it's on your head. We just want to make sure that we're right underneath him, though, just in case anything goes wrong. And, Marion, look at that. So, can we take this a step further? I just want to see. Can you put your pinky in there? All right. So it's not a blackboard, right? It's real science here. Actually, you just proved two incredibly important physics concepts. Okay? The first thing that you just proved is that using pulleys to multiply your force, a 13-year-old girl is able to hold up a man who weighs Too enough fit. to preside over an audience of 720 people, which is phenomenal. But you know what else you just proved? Marion, you just proved that a girl with her little pinky could easily do the work of any four men. Nice work. Nice job. All right, should we let this guy back down? All right, we're going to let you back down, Bobby. Coming down. Right. Here's the runway. Boom up the runway. He's coming in hot. Oh! Ow, what just happened to my hand? Why, did, why is it turn friction? That's because we're awesome. Thank you. Cool. All right. The stunt science team can come to your school and raise your test scores or to your company or event and get your team psyched about innovation. We have programs for kindergarten through college, professional development for teachers, and keynote shows for all audiences. We received the STEM Presenter of the Year Award from Time Warner Cable twice. Bring everything you need for an engaging experience, including our professional stunt airbag. Even with explosions, enjoy solution chemistry with movie stuff. See live stunts, ride in a ball of air, slide down a zip line. Lift friends and parents with pulleys. Shoot an air cannon. Fill out with liquid nitrogen. Fire a massive slingshot. See live movie fireballs. Or let us build a mega egg drop station. From across America to the North Pole, from the Middle East to the heart of Serbia, and 5,000 kid-filled venues along the way, we're committed to using the power of Hollywood to prepare young people to tackle the world's biggest problems. Call Steve now at 512-OLD-WOLF. That was fun. All Thanks right, now I have to get back into this thing here.
Oh, that's it. Okay. Am I live? Yes, you are. Welcome back. Great seeing you, Theo. Good seeing you too. Um, fantastic work you've just shown us, uh, Steve. Um, it reminds me why I'm so tired. <laughs> Sorry? It reminds me why I'm so tired. <laughs> I've been busy. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me, what, what, how did you start in this business? Tell us a little bit of your background and what happened for you to get into this. There was a TV show that I watched when I was a, a little kid. It was called Emergency. And it was about paramedics. It was the, the first two paramedics you know, on TV in 1972. I think there were only five paramedics in the world then. And I thought they had the coolest equipment. They could cut open cars. They could lift things. They could do amazing stuff. So as soon as I got to college, I went to, uh, to paramedic school at night. And uh, I really loved you know, being around all these emergencies and stuff. But I didn't think that it was a good thing for people to get hurt. So I wondered about how we could avoid people getting hurt. I, I ended up buying an ambulance and starting a company called Cinematics. And I would provide paramedic services on set when they were doing a dangerous stunt. They were doing a car crash or bicycle crash or a person on fire. And if the person got hurt, then I would be there to patch them up and take them to the hospital. But I noticed that a lot of time watching the, what they were setting up, I could see they were about to get hurt. You know, you, you could just see the trajectory was wrong or the gel was not right or something wasn't right. So, uh, you know, I offered my input and it was not well received. <laughs> the, the stuntman said, look, let's agree on something. You drive the ambulance, we do the stunts. Well, 10 minutes later, I'm taking the guy to the hospital. And then I got back to the set, I told the director, you know, I think that if we used a little bit more science here, if we used some technology, if we figured these things out with math, uh, we could do them more safely. You could get the same exciting movie, but we wouldn't have anyone getting hurt in the process. So I, I, I transitioned from being a, uh, a set medic to being a stunt coordinator. And then I realized that uh, stunts is really uh, a human payload at the end of a big physics experiment which is largely set up by the special effects department. So I went back to the beginning as a special effects intern and I, I worked under uh, an award-winning, uh, Academy Award-winning effects guy named Gary Zeller. And Gary really taught me, you know, how we blow stuff up and how we light people on fire. He had won an Academy Award for inventing Zell Gel, which is the gel that you put on stunt people uh, as an insulator that protects them when they're on fire. And uh, I was very inspired, he, you, know, you know, his background wasn't in movie making, he had a PhD in polymer chemistry. And that really validated my thought that uh, the film industry could advance more you know, with, with academic science being applied practically than simply by cowboying it. Uh, so I started doing, uh, special effects for movies. I ended up working on Tom Cruise films and, you know, a lot of big productions. But uh, eventually I, I kind of got bored with that. Even though people think it's exciting, there's a lot of sitting around on movie sets and there's a lot of really brilliant science being developed that's strictly being used to entertain people for an hour or two. And I thought that really wasn't the best use of science or the best use of entertainment. Uh, I thought that uh, my generation and previous generations have created a tremendous number of very serious problems on this planet. We, we have problems with, you know, communication. We have problems with transportation. We have problems in medicine. We have problems in energy. We have problems in the environment. And, you know, we're lucky. We're, we, we get to die and leave these problems to someone else, right? Except that the someone else is our kids. And it, it's not fair. It's not right for us to leave problems that we created to them without at least giving them the tools to be able to solve these problems. And the, the solution to these problems is STEM. Unfortunately, you know, kids have many options about how they spend their time and their interest. So if they have a choice between studying calculus and playing on the Xbox, you know, they're gonna play the Xbox, right? If they have a choice, you know, between uh, learning chemistry and, uh, you know, being in a virtual world on the Oculus, they're going to be in the Oculus. So I realized that we had made gaming much more appealing 
than learning these valuable things that kids were going to need to know. And so I thought what we really have to do is on, on the education side, we have to step up the game a little bit. We have to make learning as exciting as anything else that kids do. We have to make learning as fun as going to a movie. We have to make learning as fun as playing on an Oculus so that we lure kids to it. Because, you know, in, in some cultures, kids have no choice about what they do. You know, the parents say you study and they study for five hours and that's it. In most cultures, it's really not like that. So you have to make it alluring and appealing if you want kids to, to master these skills that their generation is going to need. And I thought, well, I already have a background in, uh, in entertainment and in science. And uh, I decided to hybridize those to create science in the movies. And ultimately, when someone comes to a live show or watches a TV presentation that I do, you know, my goal is for them to be as entertained as anything else they would have chosen, but to come away with some valuable tools that they're going to need to solve their generation's problems. So that's, that's kind of you know, been my career evolution. So, you know, I was teaching STEM live, you know, back in the, you know, in the early 90s. I don't think STEM was even a word. Uh, yeah, I see. And um, do you have any, um, have any, I mean, there must be tens of uh, case studies or, or of kids that you have heard that were inspired or, in a sense, how do you measure the um, effect of your teaching of your, yeah, of Okay. Well, un unfortunately, that's done with standardized testing, uh, which I think is the one of the fastest ways you can kill a child's interest in, in science. Uh, Finland has proven this well over again and again. Uh, they do no standardized testing, and on their exit tests, they score higher than anyone else because they focus on engagement and on curiosity. Uh, but my, my students in many areas have been subjected to standardized testing, and they found that students who were exposed to, to science in the movies and the STEM engagement programs that I created, if they were exposed between fifth and eighth grade, they will score on average 30% higher in their physical science tests than students who never received that type of uh, curiosity stimulation. So, you know, I set a lot of things on fire in my career. So a lot of cars on fire, buildings on fire, people's on, on fire. But I, I've always felt like the best thing you can set on fire, the greatest thing you can set on fire is a child's imagination. Once that imagination is ignited, there's no limit to where that child can go. And as well, uh, they can exceed their, their educational system's ability to teach them. So once a kid is fascinated to know how something works, it doesn't matter if their school knows, knows anything about it, if their teacher knows anything about it, they have access to the internet now, they can go Google, they can go YouTube, and they can pursue their curiosity. So I think that you know, the greatest thing any teacher can do is just stimulate a, a child's curiosity, light their imagination. I see. So um, how does it work? Uh, I mean, you, you've, uh, you, uh... You've obviously set up something for a movie first, and then once you've studied it, you come back uh, and you recompose it in order to show it to a show. Is this how it works? It, 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 there's really very few science concepts that are used in different combinations to make everything. Uh, you know, every explosion that I make on a movie set is just some variation of a chemical reaction, right? Every time we fly someone, it's just some variation of using pulleys or winches to lift that person, put them in front of a green screen. So I, I kind of distilled down what the science was uh, to six basic stunts that illustrate about a hundred STEM concepts. Okay. And um, so I don't have to, I don't have to demonstrate every, every type of stunt we do. They're all derivative of these same science concepts. And so in developing the science in the movies show, I said, look, you know, here's a hundred STEM concepts that kids really need to know if they're going to be able to rearrange them and build their own, you know, time teleportation machine or, you know, immunization suppression system or whatever they're going to make. It's, it's going to all really come down to these basic things. So the science part was almost obvious. 
Uh, and then where the, the fun part was, you know, how do we make that into a fun narrative? How do we turn that into a show? How do we make that engaging for participants and for the audience? And then, uh, and then how do we test it to make sure it's really working? Uh, you know, getting feedback from teachers, feedback from students, and it's an iterative process. Uh, you know, you show it one way, nobody laughs. You show it the other way, everybody laughs. It's like, hey, we now that joke's always going to be in the show. And then, you, you know, you just, you keep uh, refining the process. So, you know, I'm over 5,000 live shows into it. And I would recommend for anybody who wants to, you know, create material like this uh, for video, you know, work live because a live audience, you know, right away, whether the material works or not. In TV, you have no feedback. You, you have ratings, but you don't know what made it good or bad. Um, so getting out there and working with kids is super important. Also, uh, you know, just looking back on my own education, I remember very little from school, from my classes. But anytime someone came to my school and did a presentation, you know, I, I remembered that. I remember presentations, you know, from ninth grade. And that was many years ago. Uh, so I thought, you know, you, you really do, you can hit a lot of people with a little bit of engagement on TV and that's important, but to really capture a kid, they have to have, feel like they have a personal connection to you and that you invested your time in them. And, and you can only get that one-on-one -on -one or, you know, you know in, in, in front of an audience where they can interact with you. Um, so that's really, you know, kudos to teachers who can do that in the classroom every day that has the biggest impact on kids. I see, and what are these um, six main uh, types of uh, stunts? Could you name them for us? Would, would we sure. understand? Sure, the, the, the first thing we do is uh, fill the room with smoke. Uh, okay. Using just a couple of uh, milliliters of liquid, and we heat that liquid up and it turns into a gas. And so this is a good basis for a discussion about states of matter that the same, the same chemical can exist as a solid, a liquid, a gas, a, a, a gel, an aerogel, a plasma, strictly as a function of temperature and pressure. Mm. So, so that's a, a smoke machine is a pretty simple device. Uh, you know, anyone can buy one for, you know, 15 euro and uh, bring that in the classroom. And you can just show how a teeny little bit of liquid where the molecules are touching each other when it's heated and those molecules turn into a gas, they can fill an entire room on, a, on an order of magnification in the billions in terms of its, its volume. So that's stunt one, you know, the, the prop is a stunt, is a, is a, is a, a smoke machine, but the lessons are, are pretty wide uh, in states of matter, properties of matter. Um, uh, the next thing we do is uh, setting a house on fire. So I, I built a little aluminum house, we feed it with propane, we use uh, valves to control the flow of the gas to the different uh, windows and doors. Um, and then we can talk about, you know, what is fire? Uh, it's a chemical reaction. It involves fuel, oxygen, heat, and then a chemical reaction where the fuel and the oxygen combined to make something new. Uh, and this is very much like uh, spelling, right? You could, you could take three letters, you know, you arrange them one way and it makes one word, you arrange them another way, makes another word, but you haven't changed the letters, you've just rearranged them. And chemical reactions are the same thing, right? We're, we're not changing the atoms, we're just saying, you know, we're taking you from here, we're putting you over here. And now instead of, a, you know, if we took the letters that spell like a hot coal, we rearrange them and we could spell cool hat. And you're, you know, the, the hat's not made out of coal, but it's made out of the same elements. Yeah. So. Um, so just so the house on fire could, can, can teach chemical reactions, it can teach fire dynamics, it can teach about heat, radiation, convection, uh, how we're getting light energy, uh, how we can change the color of the fire by changing how efficient the chemical reaction is, right? So when I just leak propane into that building, I get a big yellow fire because it's not a very efficient reaction. There's not really enough oxygen mixing with the propane and some of it just comes off in the form of carbon uh, and then that carbon gets is heated up and it glows red, and that's what makes that fire red. It, but when you, when you're cooking at home, you don't want a lot of carbon putting soot all over your pots. So 
they introduce more oxygen into the into the uh, fuel stream. So you get a complete combustion and then you get that nice clean blue flame, which doesn't produce any carbon and gives you more heat, but it would look crappy on a movie. Nobody wants to see a house on fire with little blue flames, right? You want to see big yellow flames and, you know, just to make it exciting. Um, but the ability to make it, you know, a big, you know, ugly fire or not is, you know, you have to understand that you're working with chemistry and that you're controlling how much oxygen gets into your chemical reaction. Um, so that would be, you know, stunt two. Uh, stunt three would be um, playing with the pulleys, right? How we, how we can lift things that are much heavier than us uh, by using mechanical advantage. So that introduces simple machines, whether we wanna talk about levers, screws, wedges, inclined planes, uh, you know, these. And, and it is true that I learned about pulleys in fourth grade and I was very excited about this idea of lifting heavy things uh, because I was a little kid and I bought pulleys at the hardware store and I hooked them up in a tree and I, and I lifted my mom up there and she was terrified. She screamed her head off. I thought that was so funny. I, I carry pulleys in my car every day. I, I use them all the time. Um, and you know, so, so concepts of mechanical advantage um, were, are, are made very clear through that, especially you know when you see a, a little girl in second grade and she holds up the football coach at her school with one finger you know, because she's dividing the load by the number of, of, of rope segments that are, are used. So uh, teaching kids how to, how to actually solve that as a paper problem too. If they, you know, here's a load, you know, here's some ropes, how much is it gonna take to lift it? Just count the ropes and divide the load by the number of yeah. ropes, right? Um, uh, I introduce an airbag just to, to, to talk about the compressibility of air as a means of decelerating falling bodies, falling human bodies. Um, I, I, I create an air cannon where we release compressed air. So in the, in the airbag, you're compressing air as a way of decelerating. And then in the air cannon, you're starting with compressed air, releasing that as a way to push something. So we could talk about you know, the compressibility of gases, uh, about pressure, about force, um, that, that an air can is a, is a machine that converts pressure, which is energy pushing in all directions, into force, which is energy moving in one direction. And that's simply by releasing the pressure through a single point. When you release pressure in all directions, you get an explosion. Uh, and when you get release it in one direction, you get a force you know, that can be used to direct a projectile, whether that's a person or a grenade or you know anything that's being a beer bottle flying across the set in a movie is all done with these air cannons. So you have variables that you can control how much pressure uh, and what's the degree of the trajectory that you're launching it and what's the weight of the projectile and how much air resistance does it make. So anytime you see something flying in a movie though, there's probably an air cannon behind it. So we demonstrate kids uh, for kids how that works as well. So those, those would be, you know, just, you know, a handful of two suitcases, uh, but we can build a big show from that and teach a lot of STEM concepts. And humor is super important too. Uh, people can only, you know, withstand what their butt can stand. You know, they, 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 if, if you're laughing, if you're engaged, uh, then the material is not intimidating and it shouldn't be intimidating. You know, there's nothing that I'm teaching that they didn't know, you know, <clears throat> 3000 years ago, hmm. much of this came from Greece. So, yeah, you know, your, your audience should just uh, genetically be attuned to this material. You know, back when, when, uh, Aristotle came up with pulleys, right? <laughs> who came up with pulleys? Um, yeah. I don't know, I would have to Google it. All right, well, some pretty smart guys a long time ago, <laughs> before they could explain these things, uh, you know, on paper, we're, we're doing it physically in the world and understanding the physics that make it possible. That's one thing we have to thank the Greeks for, not to mention democracy. Thank you. Tell me, um, what have you been doing the last 12 months with regards to the lack of physical events? How do you, uh, have you continued doing this work? 
I've done some virtual events. I've created videos for virtual events like the, you know, the Aston Science Festival and the, the World Science Festival in New York. And then um, really just making use of the downtime for developing some new projects. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I'm working on has been uh, methods for combating forest fires or wildfires. It seems that as, as oh, now in the United States, we're allowed to say that climate change is real, finally. So um, without, without repercussion. Right? It's about time. Right. Um, it is about time. Um, so uh, one of the things that climate change is driving is the amount of uh, wildfire, uh, the amount of acreage or hectares that are being burned up by wildfires around the world has been increasing steadily over the last 10 years. And a lot of data scientists have been uh, confirming, you know, how this is changing the planet and where the fires are gonna start and how long they're gonna last. But we need more mechanical engineers figuring out, okay, well, that's, that's all very nice. Now, how do we put the fire out, right? You don't, when your house is on fire, you don't need a mathematician to come and tell you how long it's gonna burn and how many Kelvins, how much heat is being released. You just yeah. want the fire out. So. I'm working on developing some new technology for uh, wildfire suppression. And I hope to bring that to market very soon. So really cool. that kind of work where you really have to sit down and figure stuff out and you know write a 50 page patent that explains your technology. Uh, COVID is great for something like that. You know, no interruptions, nobody coming over, you're not going anywhere. You can sit and get some, some good blocks of work done. So that's, that's pretty much what I've been doing. What about you? Tell me, um, I think that this question might be one, uh, one that a few people would like to ask you. The movie stars that you've shown in your video, do you get to meet them? Have you met them? Do you, how does it work? Yeah, and yeah. What is it like? Um, you know, every interaction has the possibility to go bad, right? So the fewer interactions you have on a movie set, the better. The best thing you can do on a set, and I do get to meet all, I do get to meet the stars and to work with them. But the best thing you can do on a movie set is just do what you're getting paid to be there for. You know, if you're getting paid to come and make a fire, come make a great fire and leave. Uh, you know, ev everyone there has a, a lot of pressure on them. They're they're busy. They're stressed. A lot of money. Every second, it's about you know. $11,000 every, what is that? What is that in Euro? It's a lot of Euro. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of money, you know, every minute when you have 250 people on set working, you have to be very prepared. You have to be very professional. You have to come in and do your job and then, and that's it. That's what will make you a hero. If you want to start schmoozing with uh, the movie stars and this and that, you run the risk that you're going to say something that, you know, goes against their politics or goes against their whatever. And then, you know, before you know it, you're gone because it's a very competitive industry uh, for every person working on that set. You know, there's 500 people who wanted to have that job. So my advice is just do your job well and don't, don't be there to socialize, you know, don't go up to Al Pacino and ask him for an autograph when he's trying to get ready for the next scene. Um, you know, you'll impress people just with doing, being good at what you're there to do. Um, but I have learned a lot from working with actors and I learned a lot about professionalism. Uh, and I learned a lot of that from working with Tom Cruise. Uh, he was the most, uh, I don't know anything about his personal life and what happens in the media and it's not my business, but I watched him work firsthand and I saw uh, someone who was completely prepared for everything that he was asked to do, you know, if, if he was going to be running, he, you know, he ran. If he had to fly a helicopter, he had spent two years learning how to fly the helicopter. If he had lines to learn, he knew all the lines. Um, and he considers himself, you know, very lucky to have the job he has. And he shows his appreciation by being great at it and expecting the same from other people he works with. The other thing that I saw him do that really impressed me was um, he had just finished a scene and the director, Sidney Pollack, said, great job, Tom, cut, print, moving on. And that, that basically would have released him, right? He would have been done for the day. And he said, no, I think I could do better. 
and he he kept the crew there and he did the scene until he felt he did it as well as he could not till other people felt that he did, they they did it as well as they wanted him to do and so holding himself to his own level of excellence his own expectations of what he considered perfection i thought was really inspiring and he got where he is you know not by getting away with how little he could do but by doing the most he could do I so see. And then I've seen actors on the other spec end of the spectrum, you know, not prepared on drugs, keeping everybody waiting, not knowing their lines. And uh, when you when you see the two examples of the type of people that are out there, it, it makes it easier to choose the type of person that you want to be, and it, it gives you models for what that behavior looks like. So I anybody see. anybody can be polite at nine in the morning, right? But the professionals are the ones who are just as polite 15 hours into the day. Mm. And when I saw that, you know, I was young. I was in, in my 20s as I came into the business. But I, I saw that and, I, and I, I looked at those people and I thought, you know, that's, that's how I want to be. I see. We have a cool question here from the audience. Um, was at a time when some of the stunts you the movies you have worked with um, went wrong? There have been times when stunts didn't go well. Uh, either they were underwhelming, you know, the explosion just didn't go the way you thought it would. And with everybody watching on set, there's a, a temptation to get nervous. Uh, like, oh, damn, I screwed up. Um, so you have to just jump back into your non-emotional scientist mind and say, okay, well, let me just retrace what happened here, retrace the wires, retrace the reaction, figure out the problem, come back and solve it right away. Um, and then there were, you know, times where I was working on someone else's stunt, you know, and something went wrong, somebody got hurt. And you have to do the same thing there, resist the temptation to say, you know, you idiot, why didn't you set the brake on that car before it ran into somebody? You have to treat it like a, an academic body of knowledge and realize that if you if you point fingers at people they get defensive and then you lose the opportunity to learn what happened so to, to treat everything as a, as a learning opportunity to say okay well th this is what he did and this was the negative result from that so now let's make sure just to send a memo out to the industry let everyone know you know don't do it this way do it that way um so you know, a non-judgmental approach to your own mistakes and the mistakes of others. I see. And something else I, I, I find quite inspiring as a message is that your background is in English, in, in literature, right? Yes. Your, your academic right. background. And it's, it's a very nice lesson to give to people that uh, basically um, you can work on almost everything you would like to. Uh, could you, could you explain to us if, if there is any correlation to your studies, to the work you're doing now, how do you explain it? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I studied at Columbia University in New York, uh, 18th century British literature and Shakespeare were, were my majors. And so first I thought, well, for this, for this writing that I'm reading, there's a lot of art to it. Um, and there's also durability. And I wondered, you know, what did Shakespeare have available to him that other authors of his time didn't have? You know, why are we still reading Shakespeare, but we're not reading the other authors who were writing alongside him? What, what were his tools? 26 letters, that's it. He only had access to the same raw materials for writing that every other author had access to. But the way he arranged them was so uniquely creative that his work was became immortal and, and will, will be read forever and will influence literature forever that we can anticipate. And so I, I started thinking about science the same way. Uh, all scientists have access to the same raw principles of physics that govern the universe, right? We, we have gravity, we have acceleration, we have, you know, the laws of thermodynamics, we have resistance, we have capacitance, you know, whatever we have, right? It's a, it's a very finite number of rules that 
run the universe. Uh, what will differentiate whether a scientist is putting, you know, rovers on Mars versus, you know, uh, in, inventing, uh, you know, silly putty, you know, is, is simply a matter of how they rearrange those things. So that gave me the idea, you know, early on that science wasn't so much about, uh, you know, learning to do the math and all that. There's computers for that. It, it was it was about the creativity. It was about how do you take these these raw fundamental concepts and arrange them in a unique way that no one else is doing that gives you a product or a result or a capability that no other uh, scientist is developing simultaneously. Uh, so, so. Well, I, I don't have an academic background in science. You know, I would say that I, I have like a PhD in fifth grade science, uh, that I know the fundamentals of science, of the, you know, the basic elements of science, you know, backwards and forwards with great familiarity. And I'm not intimidated by any higher science because I know it's all just a construction of those same simple concepts, that, that no matter how fancy someone's writing is, it's all broken down to the same 26 letters. Uh, so, you know, don't be intimidated by it. Um, be enticed to know that all of science is easily accessible if you just learn a few simple concepts. I see. Okay, great. This is very hopeful for uh, a lot of kids, I think. Um, yeah, don't, don't, be, don't be intimidated by science. Uh, there's, there's nothing that you can't understand. Uh, life is very short. And the people who are a lot older than you, they're not really that much older. It's, it's you know, it goes by in minutes. So yeah. you're quickly capable of learning just as much as anyone else knows about science. And then putting your own spin on it, adding your own creativity to it, so that you can invent something that your parents never would have thought of. I see. Um, we have a few more minutes. Would anybody from the audience like to ask something? In theory, we have something like three or four minutes left. If yes, um, please write it now. Otherwise, I will um, I, I will ask for um, perhaps if Steve, would you like to come with a final message? Um, if if nothing comes up. Let's let's give uh, ten seconds or something. Yeah, I'll I'll give my final message while we're waiting. Yeah, all right. Um, uh, basically, um, my career over the last thirty years has really been fascinating, and it's been one that I created entirely, you know, of my own imagination. Just always following what I thought was fascinating, doing what I thought was interesting, and then you know trying try to be good good enough at it, you know, that you could get hired for it, but. I don't care whether a kid becomes a scientist, whether they, you know, want to, you know, pick up garbage, whatever they want to do, you know, whatever you're passionate about, that's that's what you'll be good about, good at. That's what you'll enjoy. Uh, science has always been my passion, uh, simply because I'm curious about mysteries, and I wanted to understand the mystery of, you know, how does the universe work, and how did we get here, and what's this all about. And then uh, the more I looked around, I said, wow, I'm, I'm not sure anyone has those answers, but this place is pretty screwed up. And it, there's a lot, there's room for improvement anywhere, everywhere. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to be a scientist to look around at the world and figure out how to make improvements in it. And that's what I would encourage anyone to do. It's just how can you leave this place a little bit better than you found it? Um, how can you make the place a little smarter, a little healthier, and a little more kind? That's a very nice message. Oh, that's a very nice message. Um, oh, there's one question. Um, has it ever been a problem spending too much time working and not having time for other aspects in your life? Is that my son or my girlfriend? <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, it has been. I, I'm I'm a bit of an obsessive character. And I'm, I'm very driven, but I, whatever it is that I'm working on in the moment, um, sometimes the compulsion towards work comes from my own drive and passion towards what I'm working on. Uh, 
Sometimes it's the necessity of the project itself. Uh, if you're working on a movie, you know, you have 90 days to finish an hour and a half of, of movie and there's a lot to do and long hours. Um, but I, I'm not sure you always have a choice in the matter though. It's either your own passion or external pressures that, that force you to spend a lot of time on things. Um, I see a question about CGI and practical effects. Um, yeah. So I'm a practical effects guy because I love the science. Um, CGI people, they spend all day at the computer. I don't like to sit that much and I don't like computers that much. Um, they, they have their role. What I do is I try to figure out um, how can CGI help make practical effects safer? But at this point, um, CGI is not going to replace physical effects because it takes a long time to render an explosion uh, on a screen, you know, weeks of render time at this point to get one explosion. If the director doesn't like it, you know, more weeks uh, where I can go out and if, if they want to see a car blow up, I can blow that car up a dozen times before lunch and the director can just, you know, pick, pick what he likes best. Uh, so CGI is, a, it's an interesting field. It's, I, I just, you know, I like to work with my hands. I like to, to see physics in operation. Great question. I think I was going to predict that for you. Yeah. And for the person who asked about, you know, spending too much time on work, it's not the best idea. Uh, in, in the end, uh, all of the research says that uh, your satisfaction in life comes from the quality of your relationships. So if you, if you do have the ability to... Uh, to harness yourself a little bit back in and put more time into your kids and your family and your relationships. Uh, that's probably a good thing to do. Um, I think there's one, let's, let's take this as a last question because okay. we are running out of time. Which is the most difficult STEM for you in movies? The most difficult STEM? Well, of course, that has to be mathematics. Uh, um, figuring, you know, t taking the time to mathematically figure out, and and this is where you know some of the CGI background can come in, not in terms of the graphic images, but using computers to solve physics problems. Uh, you know, two cars are going to collide. Where's the wreckage going to land? Uh, one car hits something. There's an unbelted passenger. Where are they going to land? So to, using computers uh, has been new for me as a way to figure this out. Um, I liked it better with the slide rule and a, and a calculator. Uh, you know, your slide rule never runs out of batteries. Uh, so the more we, we rely on technology, uh, to some degree, the more fragile uh, our ability to perform is. Um, my my. CGI program that someone's running, you know, that may crash and may delay a project. Uh, the pulleys always work. The air cannon always works. The air bag always works. So there's a fundamental physical reliability uh, to working in, in physical science. And uh, just like, you know, what I'm finding in the, in the firefighting thing, you know, you can, you can math the fire to death all you want. You still have a fire until you figure out how to get water on it take away the oxygen and take away the fuel, you still got a problem on your hands. So th there's, there's not a, a short step within the world of a computer that can replace the things that need to be done in the physical world. Okay. Steve, uh, it's been amazing having you here. Um, Theo, thank you so much. You've been doing great work and it's very inspiring. Um, we'll certainly follow you and uh, see, is there a space we can watch your work? Uh, I periodically crank out television shows uh, for Discovery um, and other networks. Okay. Uh, welcome to follow me on Facebook or LinkedIn. All right. Yeah. Okay. And I, I usually post what I'm working on so people can follow along and share some STEM examples from the work I'm doing. Thank you very much. And... Uh, Keep in touch and stay safe. Thank you.
Okay. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.